In this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know before starting to prepare for the decision-making component of the UCAT. The UCAT is a tough exam. The decision-making component is no exception to that, despite it being my favorite section by far. I like it because there is generally less time pressure, and it is more focused on logic and reasoning rather than speed, unlike some of its counterparts. Damn that verbal reasoning exam. In this video, I'm going to cover the five question types that you will come across when doing both decision-making practice and in the actual exam, giving you a framework for how to answer these questions, as well as many tips along the way for how to best approach these. Do feel free to skip to any questions or parts that you feel least comfortable with, as well as rewatch or pause any parts that you find more tricky, as this video will be a whistle-stop tour through all of the decision-making component of the UCAT. Let's get right into it! So overall, the UCAT decision making has 29 questions, which you have 31 minutes to answer. These questions are usually standalone, so they're quite different from the verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, and abstract reasoning, which all have sets of questions in which you answer multiple questions for one question stem. So to start off with some general tips. How to save time is probably the most important thing you can do, as well as the hardest thing you will have to do for the UCAT. There are only so many techniques you can take to help you save time. One of them, for example, is to get good at mental maths. However, the single, single most important thing, and I cannot stress this enough, please, if you take away anything from this video, practice, practice, practice. Practice. It's really just like learning an instrument. At the beginning, you're going to be terrible. You're going to be playing wrong notes and not understanding what the different dots on the barred lines mean, and it's all going to be a bit confusing. And that's exactly how it is with the UCAT. But over time, if you practice and practice and practice, then you will get good at the UCAT. Ignore watching a bunch of YouTube videos, ignore paying ton loads of money for tutoring. Honestly, nothing is equivalent to doing enough practice for the UCAT. What I would recommend is getting something like a one month bundle, ideally from Medify. Medify is what I use for the BMAT and I found that it worked for me. I used the Medic portal for the UCAT and I won't say it was worse, but you can get my gist. Medify specifically has unlimited questions, basically. Like, it is really unlikely that you will finish all the questions on Medify. And these questions are probably the most similar to the actual exam that you'll get, as well as having really great features where you can actually track your progress, which does really help in practicing for the UCAT. To reiterate, if you take anything at all from this video, is to please go do practice questions on the UCAT now. However, if you're looking for a little bit more support and you don't know what to do with the decision-making component, then that's okay. I'm now going to go through the different question types and I'm going to give you specific tips on how to approach these questions as well as actually approach them myself so that you can see my thought process and how I would help someone work through these questions because they can be quite challenging at first. The first question type that I'm going to talk about are syllogisms and drawing conclusions. Now, these questions are always going to have one stem, which is basically a small paragraph of information, and then one little line reading, say whether this is true or false, and then five separate statements, which you have to say yes or no to, depending on whether you think they're true or false. Now, the important thing to note is that you have to draw only from the information that's given to you in the stem. You would say no to an answer if either you know that it's false based on the information above, or you can't tell based on the information that's given, which is something that really does catch a lot of people out. Let's take a look at an example, just so you can see what I mean. Just a note, all of the questions that I use in this video are free and available online at MedEntry, which I'll link in the video description. Take a moment to pause and read the question if you need to. At a conference for anaesthetists in Sydney last year, none were men who had subspecialized in chronic pain management. Place yes if it follows, place no if the conclusion does not follow. Only female anaesthetists were present at the conference. Now, we don't know this. It says that none were men that had specialized in chronic pain, but there may be other specialties, so this would be no. Any man at conference was not a chronic pain management specialist. This is exactly what they say, so yes. There were female anaesthetists who had subspecialized in chronic pain at the conference. Well, we don't know this one, and there might be female anaesthetists who do have this specialty, but there might also not be. We can't tell from the information that's given. Therefore, we have to put no. Very few male anaesthetists were present at the conference. Again, we have no way of knowing. They just say that there's no males with this very particular subspecialty. We don't know if there's many or there's few. So again, we put no. No anaesthetist at the conference who had subspecialized in chronic pain management was a man. So this is exactly what they're saying. Someone who subspecialized in chronic pain can't be a man. So this answer is yes. As you can see from this question, it's pretty straightforward. There isn't much to know, and you just use exactly what's in the information in the text and don't make any inferences, don't make any other conclusions, and literally just use the information to answer the questions. And that's all you have to do. It's yes or no answers. Let's do another question, which I find a little bit harder. 
Jeremy, Tony, Jacob, and Lucy are students who go to the same school. Jeremy only follows two people from school on Instagram. Everyone at school follows Lucy. The only people whom Tony follows on Instagram are those who follow him first, and Tony follows Jeremy. So this is a lot of information, and we just need to break it down to answer the question. Now, there's generally two ways of approaching these. You can either take each statement individually and answer it based on the information that's given, or you can try to figure out most of the information and then answer the statements in quick succession because you already have a framework and an organization system for the information that's given to you. For this kind of question, ideally, you would make use of the whiteboard that's given to you in the UCAT. This is really useful, and I didn't use this whiteboard at all in my UCAT, and that was a mistake. That was really dumb because I could have done, and it would have made things so much easier. And now whenever I have people asking me about the UCAT, I do suggest using it because it's there to help you. We have four students. We have Jeremy, Tony, Jacob, and Lucy. Okay, so let's start. Jeremy only follows two people. Fine, that doesn't give us any information. Everyone at school follows Lucy, so everyone follows Lucy. And then we have the only people who to Tony follows are those who follow him first. And Tony follows Jeremy, but then Jeremy also follows Tony. We also know that because Tony is following Lucy, Lucy must therefore also follow Tony. Now let's actually answer the question. The only people who Jeremy follows from school are Tony, and Lucy. This is true. Jeremy is only following Tony and Lucy. Lucy follows Tony. We can see here that Lucy follows Tony. So this is also true. Jacob follows Lucy. Everyone follows Lucy. Therefore, this is true. The number of people who follow Tony must be greater than or equal to the number of people who are followed by Tony. Now, this must also be true because Tony is a follow for follow kind of guy. He only follows people who follow him. Therefore, the number of people following him are equal to or greater than whoever he's following. Lucy follows Jeremy. You can look at our map here and see that Lucy only follows Tony. Lucy does not follow Jeremy. So this is false. No. And it's as simple as that. Now, you can do it the way I did it, or you can just go through each statement and figure out whether this is true or not based on whatever information you have. This will get more confusing, and having that little map there will allow you to get more consistent results at the cost of time. The method I used, I found, is really useful for when you are being bombarded with loads of information, because it basically just lets you keep track of all this information and doesn't let you lose sight of what's going on in the general picture. Now let's move on to the second type of questions, which are logical puzzles. Again, here, making use of your whiteboard can be quite useful in just allowing you to keep track of all the information that's being thrown at you. Losing yourself in the volume and number of statements that they throw at you is the most common pitfall with these types of questions. I'd recommend practicing from the get-go with a whiteboard so that you get into the hang of it and you don't make the same mistakes that I did, which was not using the whiteboard at all. Okay, let's look at question two here. An Olympic athlete has put her medals up on the wall for everyone to admire. She has won six medals, two golds, and four silver. The medals are from two Olympics, 2000 and 2004. The medals are arranged as follows. Okay, so from the get-go, we want to draw something. So ideally, we just arrange them how they would be on her stand. Medal two is gold. Both medals were won in the 2004 Olympics. So 04, gold. Medals one and three were won in 2000. These must also be silver because both gold medals were won in 2004. At most, only three silver medals are on the corners. This means that silver medal is either here or here. And we know that a gold medal is here or here because at most three silver medals are in the corners. This means we know that a silver medal is here. All medals won in 2000s are hung adjacent to at least two medals one in 2004. Now that's quite confusing and I don't really know where to approach it from here. So now I'm just going to read the question. I've noted down as much information as I think is necessary for now. Which of the following could be the kinds of medals that four, five, and six are respectively? Starting from here, we know that this one must be silver. So immediately we can cancel out option B. Looking at A, we know that this over here is gold and we only have two golds. So we can't have two golds in the second row. So A is definitely wrong as well. Looking at D, we know that at least one of them in the bottom row has to be gold. So there can't be three silvers in the bottom row. So D is obviously wrong. So therefore, C is the correct answer. Now this question at first glance may seem quite difficult and it's quite hard to process all of the information that's being given to you. Putting together all of the different pieces when there's too much just isn't really possible. And that's why I really recommend using the whiteboard because as you saw there, having that little visual aid there basically just made that question so, so much easier than it would have been otherwise. Now one major tip with this kind of question is once you have the answer, just stop. There's no point in continuing because most likely your answer is correct. And there's no point and no time in trying to figure everything else out just to make sure that whatever conclusions you made were correct. Often this will just be in vain and will be absolutely pointless. So don't keep going once you have an answer. You may feel uncertain not knowing that your answer is correct, but there is honestly no time to double check, so it's not worth it. 
Moving on to the third type of question, evaluating arguments. I'd say these are probably my favorite, largely because these are probably the most that rely on intuition rather than actually knowing the stuff. So these questions have a stem and then they ask you to choose the strongest argument or the weakest sometimes based on that stem. Here, it is really important to note that you have to choose the strongest argument even if it's something that you totally disagree with, if it's the strongest argument, then it's going to be the right answer. Often, the strongest arguments are those that address directly the key points, address the most key points, and have the most adequate breadth. So they don't go too broad, and they're not too specific. As abstract as that sounds, I'm going to take you back to the thing I said at the beginning, which is just practice. If you practice these, then you will gain more intuition to what I mean by this, in that the strongest arguments are those that are really focused on the question stem. Another great way of doing this is to eliminate all the weak arguments. There are a few rules of thumb, and I didn't make these rules, a friend of mine did, and she's a lot more systematic in her approach to the UCAT, so I feel they might be helpful. Obviously, she also scored a lot higher than me, so I would kind of trust what she says. So to eliminate the weak arguments, think about relevance. Is this question relevant? Does this statement cover all the aspects of the question? The more it covers, generally, the stronger it is. If the statement ignores a big part of the question, then it's probably not a very good argument, and you can likely cancel it out. Does it use any outside knowledge? If yes, eliminate immediately. Is it making generalizations or giving opinions? If so, eliminate it. And finally, the could versus should. If a question asks for whether something should be done, then an answer saying that something could not be done is often going to be a weak argument. The fact that something is difficult to do does not mean it should not be done. I would keep these rules in mind for when you do these questions. Obviously, don't use them as an end-all for-all because they aren't going to answer every single question you do, but they are really worth keeping in mind. Let's do a quick question just to put this into context. Should the Australian government be able to monitor and read all telephone conversations? Select the strongest argument from the statements below. Okay, so let's look at the first two that say yes. Yes, it's important for the police to be able to prevent terrorism. This just feels kind of irrelevant. It's talking about the Australian government listening, whereas now it's talking about the police. I'm confused. So I would say this is a bad argument because it just leaves me confused and thinking, yeah, so what? Yes, so that the government can help plan for infrastructure. This again feels irrelevant. What does infrastructure have to do with reading telephone conversations? Honestly, I have no idea. So I would say not a good argument. No, because it would be technically very difficult to do this. So this comes into the should versus would rule, which is a great application of it. So this, we can immediately cancel it out as a bad argument. This isn't answering the question. The question is asking whether you should do it, not asking if you can do it. So this one is also a bad argument. Therefore, the strongest argument is probably going to be the last one. Let's read it anyway. No, because it is a serious infringement of civil liberties. This sounds perfectly reasonable. So this is clearly the answer. Okay, so moving on to question type four, these are the Venn diagrams. So there are two main types of Venn diagrams. Firstly, there are some weird shapes with a bunch of overlaps that you have to figure out. And secondly, there are those that are basically like logic puzzles where they give you a bunch of information and then you have to mentally or physically on a whiteboard draw your own Venn diagram and then answer the questions from there. So with these questions, it can be really useful to just quickly glance at the numbers before actually doing all of the calculations. This allows you to get a gist of what the scales are so if there are obvious imbalances between sets, then you can likely cancel out at least one or two options from the answers. And this allows you to get to the correct answer more quickly. Let's do an example. A survey was conducted across some classes in a school to determine the forms of Asian entertainment media that its students engaged with in their spare time. And then we're given a big Venn diagram with the different types of entertainment media and a bunch of numbers that tell us about the students. So which of the following statements is true? More students engage with C-dramas and anime than K-dramas and K-pop only. So this question is an and. So this would be the overlap between anime and C-drama, which is this area here. And then we're comparing it to K-dramas and K-pop only. This means it's referring to people who watch both K-dramas and K-pop, but don't watch anything else. So this would be this overlap here. This means that 14 students watch these and only eight students watch these. So we know that A is correct. We can go through the other ones, but obviously we don't need to because we know the answer. If you want to pause the video now and do the math yourself and figure out why the other ones are wrong, you can. But when practicing, when doing the actual exam, there's honestly no point. For the second type of question using Venn diagrams, you have to draw your own. And these I find a lot harder. So for these, 
I would start with the main circles, the main circles, figure these out, and then I would fill in these numbers, and then I would go focus on these overlaps. This makes it a lot easier to distill the information and make it more accessible to you when you're trying to do the question. These are probably the questions that are going to take you the longest, just because they do have a lot of information and it is quite hard to keep track of everything. So make sure you do practice these and have these down to a T, so that when you do them in the exam, they come naturally and you can do them at a quick fire pace. Okay, let's move on to the fifth and final question type in the UCAT decision making, which is probability. Now for many students, probabilities can be some of the hardest parts of the UCAT. I'm going to give you a couple of strategies which you can use to make it either easier or faster so that you can then apply these when doing your own practice and your own revision. Again, I would suggest always using the same method for when doing revision, just so that when you get to the exam, you know exactly what you're going to be doing and you know that it works so you can just get down and do it without having any unnecessary complications when you're sitting the exam. What I personally like to do is draw a tree diagram. These are so simple and they make so much sense. They really just give the answer at the end of it without you having to actually think or do much maths. This being said, there are simpler ways of doing probabilities where often they will just give two events and either give an and statement, so A and B, or an or statement, A or B. So basically, you just need to multiply the fractional probabilities when there's an and statement and sum the fractional probabilities when there's an or statement. This is basic probabilities and you've likely come across this in your math classes. When you can tell that the probability question is quite simple, then doing something like this is much quicker and can be quite useful. However, if you want a more meticulous approach like I did, then using a tree diagram is probably the best way to go. Let's do a practice question to put this into context. Joe has five 50 cents and three five cent pieces. He picks two of these coins at random, one after another. Joe states that the probability that both coins will be 50 cent pieces is one quarter. Is Joe correct? So looking at the options we have available, generally they give actual probabilities that we need to calculate. So we should probably calculate them. So for the first event, there is 50 cents and there is five cent pieces. And then the second event, there is 50 cents, five cent pieces. So what we're looking at is this probability here. We also know that we want an and because it's both coins will be 50 cent pieces. This means we need to multiply probabilities. So now let's figure out which probabilities we actually want to be multiplying. The probability of the first piece being 50 cents is 5 over 8, and the probability of the second piece being 50 cents, because he's already taken away a piece, is going to be 4 over 7. Then we just need to multiply these together. It'll equal 5 over 14. Great. So now we have our answer. No, the probability is 5 over 14. Again, with these kinds of questions, I would recommend using the whiteboard. If you don't want to use the whiteboard, then you can, you know, just do probabilities like this. But as you saw with this question, they can be quite tricky. So if you don't break it down and you don't figure out which probabilities you want to be calculating, adding or multiplying, then you can lose track of what's important and ultimately get lost within the question, which will waste time in the end. So I would suggest using a tree diagram like this, which was really simple. I didn't even have to fill it all out just to help you visualize the information that you need. A very common pitfall with probabilities is if someone is confused or they're lost or they've come up with a probability that isn't an option in the answers, then there is honestly no point in going back and trying to repeat it and doing it over and over and over again, because these can really be a time sink. Like you can honestly spend five minutes agonizing over a probability question just because you missed out a small piece of information or you've done a small calculation wrong. So if this does happen, I would suggest make an educated guess and move on because you don't want to be wasting your time in this exam. Okay, so to conclude, for all that it's worth, just go do some practice, honestly. Stop watching this video, I mean, it's ending anyway, but stop watching and just go practice. If you feel sick of practicing for some reason, then my video on UCAT verbal reasoning is here, and my video on UCAT quantitative reasoning is here. And, you know, if, if, if you want to watch those, you, you, you can watch those. I would prefer you practice than watch my videos. Please go practice. Okay, go practice.